depression is about your sad, your sadness, and then anxiety is about worry. So we have um, schizophrenia, which is also very prevalent in Ghana. In Ghana? Yes, please. But this one, it sounds like some foreign, <laughs> foreign ailments. Yes. Hi, good day and welcome to another edition of The Lowdown here on Ghana Web TV. My name is Daniel Odro. Today we're going to have a very exciting conversation about anxiety and depression. Uh, many have said with the hard economic times that uh, is currently ongoing in the country, the chances and likelihood of people um, experiencing anxiety and depression is very, very high. How do you deal with people at work, co-workers, if you're a manager, how do you deal with an employee who suddenly has changed behaviors? How do you know that a, a high-performing uh, employee who suddenly become low-performing is uh, suffering from anxiety or depression? And how do you go about it? Do they seek proper medical attention or what do they resort to? Prayers? This and more on today's edition of The Lowdown here on Ghana Web TV. My guests are two. They are clinical psychologists and they will give us expert opinion on how to deal with anxiety and depression. Priscilla Ama is a clinical psychologist as well as Jude uh, Menopo, who is also a clinical psychologist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank, Thank you very much. It's, um, it's a very important conversation we're going to have today. Um, Many have said that we don't deal with these things in our part of the world very well. We, there's a stigma around it, and so we don't want to talk too much about it. I'll start with you, Priscilla. First of all, is there a difference between anxiety and depression? And if there are, what are the differences? Okay. Thank you very much. But before I answer your question, I would like um, viewers to know that we are not yet clinical psychologists. Okay. We are still students. We are still students, okay. All right. Yeah. And I want to say a good day to the viewers out there watching us. Thank you. Okay. So to the question, depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. um, we, we can be sad sometimes. Okay. Yes. We can be sad at a point. But sadness that persists so after two weeks to one month to mm -hmm. two months to three months, mm -hmm. you are still sad over that particular problem or that particular thing, that is when a person can be diagnosed with um, depression. Okay. Because the sadness should go away after some time, but if it still persists for weeks to months, and then you can bring the person for help. And then with anxi anxiety, anxiety consists of worry. Okay. Um, yeah. So when someone is worried or someone is, um, you know, un anxious, mm -hmm. yeah, about a particular um, event, mm -hmm. the person is not able to concentrate properly. The person is, is not able to go about the usual day-to-day -day activities. And then you can tell the person has anxiety, depending on the number of um, weeks that the person it's not like the person goes through anxiety this morning, the person is okay for mm -hmm. uh, two days, the person is fine, is the person anxious again? No, it has to be continuous, it has to be persistent for weeks and then for months. And then you can say this person has anxiety. So that's the difference. The difference is this is about sadness okay. and depression is about your sad. The sadness and then anxiety is about worry. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned that so the sadness must be prolonged for maybe four to eight weeks. Uh, is that accurate? Yes, please. Um, but people, different people um, brood over uh, situations differently. So people, somebody will lose their loved one or relative or whatever and they are sad for a very prolonged time. Do you, because of that prolonged uh, sadness, say that clinically? they are depressed okay so we have assessments that we use to diagnose um, okay. if the person is 
depressed or the person is the person has anxiety we have our own test we use so is the results of the test that would tell us if the person is depressed and the level of depression okay so there are levels of it yes there are levels we have mild we have moderate and we have severe oh okay it's the same with the anxiety too so if the person wakes up in the morning goes for um training after that comes back to take a shower and go to work comes back and do something else but for some time you realize the person is no more doing the usual things so there's then that other people can also tell they can tell that, that this, out this of character. person no this is not how you are mm -hmm. and it's been a long time you've changed you're not eating well you're not sleeping well you're not even going out with your friends as you used to it's affecting even your hygiene mm -hmm. you're not even tidying up your room getting up from your bed is even a problem for you so when you see such things then you can tell that this person needs help okay and then we have professionals professionals are around you can seek for professional help okay you let me let me let me come to you um so we have we have um according to priscilla mild um low mild or oh no mild, mild moderate, moderate and, and then severe. And, and severe do people usually graduate from one level to the other or what what how, how does it how do you know that this person has progressed from the mild to the moderate and to to the severe all right so to, before i answer that let me add up to what priestla said okay. with regards to how you know if someone is just brooding over a situation for a longer period mm -hmm. or the person is actually drifting into depressed mood. Okay. So, we've, first of all, with mental health or mental di uh, disorder, mm -hmm. you have to um, meet some criteria for you to be diagnosed with a mental disorder. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, we have a 3D criteria where the person must deviate from normal normalcy. Okay. So what they usually are known for or what they, are, what they do on a daily basis, they, are, they deviate from it or even deviate from societal functioning, what society norms are, are, are okay? And also the person must be dysfunctional. That means they might, they might not be able to perform their day-to-day -day activities as she mentioned earlier on. Mm -hmm. And then the third one must cause a significant distress to the individual. Okay. All right. So before so deviation dysfunctional and, and distress and distress okay. yes so before you are diagnosed with a mental disorder you must be you must go through all these three criteria okay you must be able to meet these three criteria before you are diagnosed of that condition okay all right so to your question there is likelihood that people progress over the severity of their condition mm -hmm. so from the mild state to the moderate okay. state to the severe state and this is because people at the mild state usually don't pay critical attention to the things they are going through. Okay. And they don't seek help. So they take it as though it's a, an everyday thing. It's something that is just happening at that moment. But after some time of not seeking help and not getting the right attention that you need, you would graduate into the moderate, moderate stage and then eventually get to the severe stage where things could get out of hand. In cases of depression, people get to the more, uh, severe stage and then start having suicidal ideations. Okay. Yes, and that's where it, it gets to a place where you need critical medical or psychological attention. Okay. And you have to be admitted at that point. How, how do I tell if I'm in the office and I have a colleague who's, uh, you know maybe the person's lost their father, lost a, a mother, so you understand that they are mourning and so they are unhappy. But how do I know that, okay, this is, this is gone beyond normal, you know, human <laughs> behavior yes. so that I can recommend that as a manager, this person needs to seek, I can speak to HR and say, look, this person needs to seek uh, professional help. How do I tell? Okay, so with, with that, like, there are some things that you need to know about depression. Mm. So depression before someone is, is diagnosed with depression, it comes with low mood. Okay. So persistent sadness over a period of two weeks, as she mentioned. So it must be persistent. That means every day of the two weeks, the person must be in that When sad somebody's mood. lost their, their loved one, it's normal that for two weeks, they are, if the person's not been buried, I'm going to be thinking about it, they'll be 
stealing yeah, themselves to go and cry so, and come back and all of that. Yeah. So that is the grief moment. Yes. The grief moment. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we deal with grief differently. Differently. Okay. You deal with grief differently, but when this this one is persistent, because as for grief, we understand that it's normal to grieve over a lost um, relative or loved one. But here is the case. Even with the grief, so you have stages. But if you are not able to come out of it, it will, and it persists, it will lead to depression. To depression. Mm -hmm. There are some people who, like, they've lost their loved one, but they are not grieving. Like, they are putting up a front, like they are, they are okay. But like, you can tell that it's a front. Like, once you speak to them intimately, you can tell that, you know, their the, the tear glance just opens and they are crying. But, you know, in front of people, they're acting all strong. Can that also lead to depression when you when you suppress your feelings? Um, what I would say is we have defense mechanisms that we use to protect our emotions. Okay. So the person might be using one of them ah. or some of them to control or protect his or her emotions. Okay. So like you mentioned suppression, we have repression. So it's there. Yes, I've lost this person. But because I don't want other people to notice it, or I don't want to feel sad or mm -hmm. bad myself, to be able to go about my daily activities, I try to hide it mm -hmm. um, subconsciously so that I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. So they, they rather want to um, get themselves busy doing yes. a whole lot of things, things that are not even necessary. They, you find them doing all those things yeah. just so that they don't... Um, feel sad about what is going on. It doesn't mean that they are not sad. So the moment that they are not doing anything, they are idle, and then it comes back. It comes back in their thoughts. They start thinking about it, and they start crying and all that. But is that it a good thing to do? Like, don't you allow yourself to just cry it out, you know? So, yeah, it's not so much of a good thing, but mm -hmm. like she mentioned, it's a defense mechanism, and it's the way your psyche tries to protect yourself from some significant distress. Mm -hmm. So in that, I mean, you could suppress your emotions for some time, but at the point in time, you mentioned in talking to the person, maybe intimately, the yeah. person gets to express their emotion, cry out. So when that happens, you kind of put yourself through certain sort, sort of um, stress, and this stress might not be good for you, mm -hmm. and can lead to you having a condition either physical or psychological conditions. Okay. Um, do we have data um, on anxiety, depression, or generally mental health challenges in Ghana? Do we have any data yes. to say um, it's, it's graduating and we can say, okay, because of the economic situation, people have lost their jobs, it's graduating. Is it because of financial reasons? Is it because of heartbreaks, love gone bad situations? Is there data like that available? Yes, so there is, there is, every day there is research, okay. and the research seeks to identify the prevalence of these conditions in the country. And I think the last of its kind was in 2017, and then that research says that uh, currently 10% of um, Ghanaians have mental health conditions. 10%? Certain, yes, please. So that's around, if we are 30 million people, that's around 3 million people. Yes, please. And to a certain level, so they are, like we mentioned earlier, they are mild, then moderate and severe levels of these mental health disorders. So 10% have it. But with depression and anxiety, they, they are more of the leading causes of the mental health disorders that we have because this have to do with the mood. Okay. And these moods are altered by your everyday activities, everyday events. So they are, there is a 3% um, statistics that people in Ghana have depression out of the 10 percent and then there's the two points so out of the 10 percent three percent have, have depression, depression are diagnosed with depression okay and then there's 2.9 percent that are diagnosed with anxiety disorder oh yes. okay so beyond anxiety and um depression what which other um elements fall in the mental disorder disorder uh, basket so we have um, schizophrenia which is also very prevalent in Ghana. In Ghana? Yes, please. But this one, it sounds like some foreign, foreign <laughs> ail ailment. Yes, that's true. Wow. But schizophrenia is what is known out there as madness. Okay, so when you see people having um, 
psychotic symptoms like delusions, hallucinations. And they are they are what characterize what the diagnosed schizophrenia is. Oh, okay. Yes, please. And then what else? And then also we have the substance induced psychosis or substance related mental disorders. So oh, they also take hard drugs. Yes, please. And then what else? So do bipolar and code do so they fall under? Bipolar. We have um, learning disability. We have um, dyslexia. Is yes. That, is that, yeah, yes. It's part of a learning disability. We have conduct disorder. Yes. Um, you might think that conduct disorder. Yes. What's that? When we say conduct disorder, so when a child is growing up, you see the child very aggressive. The child is not able to sit at one place for just a short time, going here and there. Some parents would say, okay. but might not realize that no, this is not just any thing, but it's a problem. Because even when the child is doing the homework, he writes tea, mommy, mommy. And we want to go and do something. Mommy wants to go and reunite. Even during lessons, they can get up like um, so many times to go and do something. And then they, they at, at the end of the day, they also inflict pain on other people. So when they are being aggressive, they want to hurt someone or they want to destroy something, they can just take your phone and then damage it. And then you say, say oh, but you have quality. And yes, you know. If you see all these signs, it's different from accidentally dropping a phone, but this one is it, it, continuous. Mm -hmm. This child um, at school is always fighting, um, not being at attention in class, doing all, all sort oh, of that's things. That's a mental disorder. Yes, yes, it is. For a child. Yes. yes. It's, 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 it's kind of it's similar to ADHD, but with ADHD, they don't harm people. They don't destroy things or they don't What's fight ADHD? or something. Attention deficit. A A D A D H D. A D H D. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's the difference between the conduct and then the A D H D. So you can't just say your child is active. Sometimes we prefer our children to be active and, and, yes. and all of that. So that when they are sick, you know that oh this one is calm now they because it's sick. But if they are destroying things it's a problem. It's a problem. They are always fighting. They always go back and they go to school and come back with a torn uniform because they were fighting and being aggressive and they are not able to sit at one place for a long time when they are doing something they stop to do another thing and then when you are, you are trying to correct them they don't want to listen to corrections and all that it's an alarm mm. and it's something you have to work on it's a red flag it's a red flag yeah. so most uh, what i see mostly is parents some parents who are not really sensitive to these things look on and then when they grow into their teen ages, and then before they realize that no, this is a problem, then before they bring them to us. Okay, all right. We'll go for our first break. When we return, it's been very eye opening already in the first 10 or 15 minutes of the show. I am sure you are learning something significant from this conversation. We'll go for our first break. When we return, we'll, we'll, we'll try and situate it to adults and especially the difficult economic situation we are in with uncertainties with job. Uh, security, etc., etc. How does that affect an adult and how they relate to other human beings? Stick, with, st stick and stay with us. We're back after this break. This advert is FDA approved. Hey, welcome back from the break. This is still the lowdown on Ghana Web TV. My name is Daniel Odro. Today I'm having a conversation about mental health in Ghana. Um, we are focusing on depression and anxiety, but we're also touching on all the other aspects uh, of mental disorder in Ghana. I'm sure you've heard. A lot of um, women who give birth say they suffer from postpartum depression. What does that mean? If your child is overly hyper 
and is prone to destroying stuff at home, could he or she be suffering from a mental disorder? Our experts are here. They are still in school, but they are almost done. And so they, they, they are uh, right in, in, in their own way to advise us. So Jude, let's continue our conversation. Okay. Um, so we mentioned 3% of mental uh, disorder cases in Ghana are depression. Another, almost 29 yeah. are from anxiety and, and the like. I want us to zero in on postpartum depression before we come back to the generics again. Okay. What is postpartum depression? What causes it? Okay. Or you think Priscilla would be best to answer? No, I think you should answer it. All right. So <laughs> postpartum depression is um, the mood changes that occur right after childbirth. Okay. So with pregnant women who had gone through the rigorous um, journey of childbirth and bearing a child, they tend to have some form of um, stress. And this stress, usually, because they are not able to deal with these stresses, it causes them to have certain mood alterations. And after the, after the childbirth, these mood alterations, if it persists, like we mentioned for the general um, major depressive disorder criteria, if the, after childbirth, if these mood alterations persist, which is the low mood, for more than two weeks, then the person can be said to have uh, de um, postpartum depression. And it's also characterized by them not taking care of themselves. So the low mood comes with um, low attention to their hygiene, low attention to their children themselves, the babies that they have been they are giving birth to. And then they keep having this um, uh, thought of worry and feeling that there is no hope for the future. Maybe they've lost uh, interest in things that they usually had interest in, which is termed as anhedonia. And this is what characterizes postpartum depression. But isn't, so isn't, okay, you want to add a bit. add to what Jude said. So um, there are hormonal changes right. in us, in women. In women. Yeah. It's not in men, it's <laughs> only in women. <laughs> yes, because the hormones, the hormones we have are different from okay. the men. So, so the changes women go through the hormonal changes and then the physical changes too. And even the thought of adding a new person to your life, okay. you have come to take care of some new being, the stress, the thought about it alone puts them into that um, situation. Is it common, postpartum depression? Is it common in Ghana? Yeah. So far, I've seen a lot. Really? Yeah. Uh, so does it go away? by itself or how, how does it go away mm -hmm. because usually when you give that there are people around you people everybody's excited everybody's helping with carrying the child the husband is excited i want to believe so why would you fall into that kind of even though you understand the hormonal changes yeah but should it persist for that long you should be happy that you have given <laughs> birth yes the, the mother should be happy but sometimes the mother can't explain why she keeps crying your baby is the nice, crying. No, oh, the, the mother, mother is herself. Crying. Okay. You see, they, they continue to cry. Even when everyone is happy, they, don't, they can't explain mm. why they are crying. It's not as if the baby was born deformed or mm. they lost their baby. Their baby is very active and the husband is even supporting. But you find this person crying mm -hmm. with, without any reason, if I can say it like that. So... So this person can come to the hospital or to see a, a psychologist for therapy. And then with therapy, it, it will go. And it's not something that it, it lasts or stays for a very long time. Mm. You know? It goes away because as you are breastfeeding the child and all that, it brings back your change, yeah. hormones and all that. I had a friend who was going through marital problems. He said they stopped having, I mean... In, they will stop being intimate. And this was like, of course, when your wife gives birth, you don't immediately have sexual relations. So, so, I mean, the usual window for, you know, allowing for sex not to happen had elapsed, and yet they were not being intimate. And the woman's argument was that she has suffered from postpartum depression and so she had lost interest in being sexual with the husband. Yeah, is, so, is, that, is that possible? Yeah, it can bring down your libido. Even so, after, I'd say, three months, four months of, of giving birth? Yes, your libido can go down. 
so that is what might cause the person not to have the interest because we have um, neurotransmitters in our brain that controls excitement. All of us or just women? All of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All of us. That is the serotonin, the okay. norepinephrine, the dopamine. Yeah. They are in there to regulate. The dopamine is in there especially to regulate our pleasure yeah. and our excitement. And then the serotonin is to give us um, um, happiness. So if that level is down, if the level it has to be has gone down, it reduces your um, desire for pleasure. Mm. Yeah. So this one, that's another cause. So Jude, if you are, if a, a wife and a husband came to you with this kind of situation, what do you, what would you tell the husband to wait for it to pass or to do what? What do they do? Because okay. if you are not careful, they will go away. They will go and seek pleasure <laughs> elsewhere. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah, I mean, you've mentioned the critical issue because such issues if not understood very well, yeah. would lead, lead the man to go out there to seek for pleasure somewhere else. But then it's important that if they come to a, a psychologist, and the first thing the psychologist does is to explain the condition to them, mm. especially both, both partners, the man and then the woman who is, is in the situation. So understanding the condition, understanding what is happening, would then give an insight to the the two partners and then they will know how to deal with such issue so yes with time with postpartum depression usually with time it dies out but then it has the propensity of becoming a uh, depression in itself mm. yes so if not treated if not paid attention to it could lead to depression so they have to understand they have to know mm. and, and I mean it's just about working things out so if a couple come to a psychologist, I mean, couples therapy, you'd have to advise them and probably opt for better ways of initiating such intimacies in the bedroom. Okay. What what have you noticed is accounting for a lot of these mental um, cases? With this difficult economic times, do you realize that finances is playing a part, job security with a lot of people losing their jobs? Is there a trend that you can see yes. uh, emerging? Yes. Yeah. So, with, with the mental disorder in itself, mm -hmm. mental illnesses in itself, there is a model that explains how it comes about, the okay. occurrence of it, which is the biopsychosocial model. So in the biopsychosocial model, it just explains the biological aspects that causes mental illnesses, the psychological aspects that causes mental illness, and the social aspect also. So in what you just mentioned, the mm -hmm. social aspect, which is the lack of finances, the issues relating to your job security, and so on and so forth, which has something in relation to your society, society or societal environment, mm -hmm. can cause you to have these mental health issues. Okay. So yes, with the recent economic hardship that we are all facing in the country, it's actually causing people to go into things, I mean, hope different coping mechanisms. So for someone who had lost his job would want to uh, find a way to relieve themselves of the stress of thinking about the, the issue of losing their job. And so would maybe depend on taking alcohol or drugs to, mm -hmm. to escape the reality of his situation that he's facing. Mm -hmm. And that could then lead to the person having a mental health issue okay. or mental health illnesses. Okay. And also, with uh, the financial constraint, I mean, poverty is a key factor, key determinant factor in mental health issues, especially with depression. If you are poor, you are unable to afford certain things that you, you would want for yourself. And so it would cause you significant stress. It would cause you uh, thinking. You will be thinking. You actually see life as worthless because you are poor. You are not able to afford things that you are supposed to do. So you would you lose hope in life. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Pesla, before we wrap up the first part of our conversation, we have seen rich people, famous people fall into depression. Yes. How do rich people and <laughs> famous people also deal with? Because if we see financial constraints and stresses are the trigger, how is a rich man also depressed? Yeah, so... <laughs> so, um, humans as we are, yeah. we are all different. Our strengths are different. The same way we have our own mental strength. Someone can receive a news, maybe a lost 
um, the person's house is burnt, mm -hmm. the person can just be like, oh, okay, where? Which house? Okay, I'm coming. The other person can will just start shouting and crying and all of that. So it doesn't mean that the first person is not affected. But yes, as we said earlier on, trying to use a defense mechanism to protect his or emotions. So just as a rich man, a poor man can go into depression or get anxious. The same, at the same time, a rich man can also go into depression because, um, yes, he's rich, he has everything at the doorstep. But there could be um, childhood experiences oh. that you might not know okay. that the person had gone through that was not resolved. So there are childhood traumas. Maybe if someone hears a news and they think it is that particular news that has caused the person to go into that stage. So there's a root but cause when, and a yes, cause. So when you come for therapy during the session, we probe into your childhood because childhood unresolved um, conflict in the brain can go a, a long way to affect you even um, when you're an adult. So you realize that maybe the child was bullied um, the person was bullied when he or she was a child and then growing up maybe a um, person lost a parent, the person goes into um, a romantic relationship and then gets heartbroken and then you realize that it, it really puts the person in a bad situation. You may think it's just the heartbreak but it may be something that started long time which was not resolved so it is the same as the rich man rich man may have the money and all that but may have gone through certain even um traumatic events to even uh, witness an accident blood and all of that some people can stand the sight of blood yeah, yeah, you see all those things and then you take it into your your sleep whenever you get to that environment you start feeling anxious because you re you remember it's a trigger it mm -hmm. triggers that um, event so a, a, a rich man can get depressed a poor man can get depressed or anxious wow. eye-opening isn't it um it's it's been a very very riveting conversation on mental health disorder in ghana and some of the telltale signs that we can look up um, to or we can try and identify with our dealings with our colleagues, with our family members, with our friends, etc., etc. I hope you enjoy this first part of our interview. We'll continue because we have not exhausted all the things that we want to discuss on this particular topic. So we'll have a part two of this conversation um, so you learn a, a, a little more of this situation. Jude and Priscilla, thank you very much for your time it's been very very revealing i've learned a lot and i hope that you've learned a lot too we're back another time with another edition of the show until then it's bye for now mm -hmm.